to the Spirit Box podcast, exploring folklore, esoterica, and the mysteries of the spirit world. I am your host, Dara, and I invite you to join me in this exploration, from the secrets of the jinn to the whisperings of demons and everything in between. This week, we're joined by Joshua Cutchin and Timothy Renner on their book, Where the Footprints End, High Strangeness and the Bigfoot Phenomenon. Uh, Joshua is an author and musician and a well-known figure in paranormal circles, having appeared in some of the best-known paranormal podcasts out there, and now obviously on Spirit Punks. Uh, Timothy is also a musician and author, and on top of that, he's a brilliant illustrator and host of the Superb Strange Familiars podcast. Um, The appropriate links will, of course, be in the show notes, so do check everything out. So today, we're going to discuss the book they co-authored, Where the Footprints End, and um, and explore that and what relevance it has to what this podcast is about in terms of exploring kind of non-human, non-physical intelligences. So what's the premise of the book? Well, despite their apparently physical nature, Bigfoot and its hairy hominid kin consistently appear mired in high strangeness. The particular ineffable and nonsensical absurdities so often encountered in paranormal phenomena. Some sightings seem more consistent with mythology than biology. Bigfoot often present supernatural attributes like luminescent eyes or the ability to pass ghost-like through structures. Anomalous lights are regularly seen in areas of frequent Sasquatch activity. Footprints persistently, if rarely, display odd numbered toes. And more bafflingly, Bigfoot trackways suddenly terminate in the middle of open, untouched terrain. In volume one of Where the Footprints End, High Strangeness and the Bigfoot Phenomenon, authors Joshua Cutchin and Timothy Renner carefully examine not only the intersection of hairy apemen with global folklore of poltergeists, fairies, extraterrestrials, magic, witches, ghosts and archetypal women in white, but also question the fundamental assumptions underlying contemporary cryptozoological beliefs surrounding Bigfoot. Um, as uh, a postscriptum, I will add, I got up to record this at 2 a.m., so if I sound even more incoherent than usual, that's why. It's also demonstrative of the kind of dedication and sacrifice that goes into bringing you this podcast. To that end, if you like the show and want more content um, in your life, more spirit box in your life, join the Patreon and the podcast Discord. It's the price of a cup of coffee and you get all the shows early and with a host of other glorious perks. Before we start the show, I want to give you the weekly open invite to send me your experiences. The links I'll leave below and you can either email me or leave me a phone message. I want to hear about your gin encounters. I want to hear about your Bigfoot encounters, your ghost encounters, poltergeists, high strangeness. Send it in. Okay, that's enough from me. Let's get into it. with timothy it's really great to have you both on uh, the spirit box thank you so much for uh, making the time out you're welcome i'm looking forward to it yeah yeah thanks for having us really what 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 i wanted to kind of have the opportunity to talk to you about is well obviously your your, your book where uh, where the footprints end um listening to, to to a lot of shows about it um having a flick through um it, it was it was you 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 really managed to do a huge amount of, of correlation work, which is which is fantastic and I think really necessary in in the territories that we're exploring here. But for the listeners, can I ask you, um, what's the what's the broad hypothesis of the book? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of funny. If if you take all the uh, all the chapters in aggregate, uh, you're going to be really disappointed because I don't I don't think there really is uh, a central thesis. I, I know when I was soliciting patrick harper for a blurb for the back of the book he sort of wanted to know the same thing and i said well um <laughs> you know a lot of these chapters are are contradictory for me and I, I i think tim will probably resonate with this but if he feels differently he can he can uh make that uh make that call himself but for me it's just that uh it's it it seems unlikely that 
we have a large flesh and blood, uh, you know, primate running around the unpopulated parts of the world. And it seems much more in line with something that is uh, folklorically um, resonant with Mm -hmm. a lot of different uh, lore throughout the world. Tim, maybe you can say it a little bit more elegantly. Well, I think, you know, if I had to say like, okay, so what's the broad hypothesis of the book? That Bigfoot is far stranger than many uh, cryptozoologists would have you believe. Right. And, and it's just a very, very strange thing. Uh, it's, it, again, like what Josh said, it's very, very difficult to put it together as, as being, you know, a simple gorilla in the woods. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's almost a, like, um, that's the hypothesis in itself. There's like, there, there's, there's no, there's no silver bullet to this. There's no kind of immediate, understandable, digestible answer. Um, I mean, some of the some of the stories are incredible, like the the bulletproof bit. I when you you guys were talking about, I I'd, I'd never heard of that before at all. Oh, and I I think Tim would agree that that's one of the more common features that you hear, even amongst people who are who are you know flesh and blood proponents. They'll say that you know Bigfoot's impervious to bullets. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, and and then they they come up with these wonderful sort of backward engineering reasons why Bigfoot could be bulletproof. Often not making sense, which, which, uh, do, do you go into that more in book two, Josh? I forget. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the, the backwards engineering, the, uh, the, the reasons why they give, you know, oh. that, that Bigfoot may be bulletproof the, the, uh, yes. So the, the, the two primary things that you'll hear is it's because of, you know, excessively thick skin or an excessive amount of body fat. And I sort of try to go through and dismantle those two arguments, uh, just from a point of logic, you know, on primates, uh, without without exception, the areas of your body that are covered with hair, regardless of the primate, uh, tend to be thinner. So mm-hmm. if you've got a giant hairy ape man, uh, it's 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 unlikely that his skin is something comparable to the thickness of an elephant's skin. So that's obviously not really a viable mm-hmm. um, answer for why Bigfoot's bulletproof. And then you know, as far as the argument of uh, of you know. A, a dense layer of subdermal fat. I mean, while it's true, you probably won't bring down um, a grizzly bear with, you know, a nine millimeter handgun. Uh, at the same time, the animals will still react when shot. And it's yeah. in case after case after case, you'll have Bigfoot hit not only with, you know, small arms fire, but also high powered rifles right. at very close distance. And they don't even flinch. They don't even blink or react. Um, sometimes they l- literally just casually get up and walk off <laughs> after being hit. <laughs> sometimes it sounds like you're shooting into a pool of water or or gel or a bowl of jello. People will say that's uh, that's remarkable. Um, <clears throat> um I, I th- there was one bit that really stood out for me uh, in again, kind of in relation to kind of some of the correlation work that I've been doing with with, with gin and fairies. Was the idea of, of possession by 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 Bigfoot? Um, could you talk to that a bit? Yeah, so it's something that doesn't at all, uh, you know, really show up that often. But it does show up enough times uh, that it's 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 worth you know addressing. Um, for example, uh, I know that in the uh, the Lancaster, yes, Lancaster, no, Lafayette County. Uh, case that Tim talks about in the beginning of the book, uh, there was an incident of a man who seemed like he was possessed. If, uh, Tim, that's sort of your wheelhouse. You want to talk about that case right quick? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's Fayette County, not Lafayette. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I mean, well, that that is, I mean, I think at the very early onset of talking about doing this book, Josh and I came to the conclusion that if we're going to pick one case to sort of be the the example of you know, weird Bigfoot stuff that, you know, maybe now there's a couple of good ones out there there's a couple, but, uh, as far as the number of things happening in a short period of time, you know, from UFOs to bad smells, to baby crying sounds, to bulletproof Bigfoot and, uh, on down to, uh, an example of this possession we were talking about. And, uh, they, he even had a sort of a apocalyptic visions a la you know, uh, contactees and so forth. Wow. All happening on one night. And there were some after effects as well that followed this witness down the road. But, uh, this fellow, uh, Kowalczyk that, uh, you know, started with the UFO sighting. He see, he was, I think there would, there were at least 10 different witnesses. There might've been 20 witnesses of this UFO 
it landed in the farm field behind his parents' farm. He and some neighbor kids hopped in a truck and went to check it out. They uh, they go see this object that was either landed on the ground. The wording of the case makes it difficult to understand whether it was hovering just above the ground or the object had landed on the ground, but it was, it was essentially a dome, which uh, they were seeing a, a red or orange orb in the sky. And by the time this thing landed, whatever was on the ground, if it was the same thing, was a they described as a white dome, I believe, a white glowing dome. And while they were there looking at this object, they saw things moving along the fence line, and it ended up being these these two Bigfoot creatures. Uh, one was about eight feet tall, and one was about seven feet tall. The, the taller one was in front. Uh, glowing eyes. I forget if they had... I think they had glowing green eyes, but I, I forget. Uh, the, there's so many different color glowing eyes with Bigfoot that it, it uh, becomes difficult to remember what color, <laughs> which, which color glowing eyes go with which case. But uh, I think these were green or yellow. And they're coming up the fence line in this very kind of determined pace where the, the, the one would walk up to a, a fence post and stop and wait and kind of make a sound. And the other one would come up and stop at the fence, fence post behind it. And then they would continue in this very determined fashion. And the kid, one of the kids got scared. He had, uh, Kowalczyk had had a, um, I think, a 30 6 rifle with him, so a pretty high-powered rifle, and said, uh, shoot, shoot. And he fired a tracer round at first above this thing. Mm-hmm. and uh, it went went above and, and lit it up so he could see it, but he said it, it kind of reached up and tried to grab at this uh, tracer round as it went by. And then uh, he fired into it. The creature made a noise. This is one of those cases where he said it sounded like he was firing into a pond. Mm-hmm. Uh, it didn't react in any other way. And when the the object that was in the field just disappeared. It, it like went out. It didn't fly away. It just kind of blinked out. Mm-hmm. And uh, they got scared and, you know, went away, called the police. The, the police called Stan Gordon, who was a kind of main investigator in Pennsylvania at the time. Stan and his crew went out there and uh, met with the witnesses and the police. And there was another encounter the witness had with the policeman when they went up to check the area out. And in any case, by the time Stan Gordon and his investigators got there, they went back up to the area again. And uh, this at some point, this the original witness, this Kowalczyk, he just started freaking out and they said he was making these like inhuman growling sounds and just running around and his own father like the quote from his own father was that uh he thought he had been possessed by one of the creatures because he was he was uttering these like inhuman cries and and growls and running around and just acting like a madman and uh when they finally got him calmed down i think he he almost passed out and they're they're carrying him off the field one of the very interesting things was uh he he wore glasses and uh, they tried to give him his glasses, which had fallen off. And he said, I, w- I don't need those. So <laughs> I don't know whether his sight was fixed in all this or he just didn't recognize th- that he needed glasses. But uh, in any case, it was a very weird detail. He says, I, I don't need those. And uh, he, when he was out, when he was possessed, he was somewhere else. And he said that he had had this very sort of apocalyptic vision, a sort of Grim Reaper-like character appeared to him and warned him that the, you know, the world was coming to an end unless mankind changed their ways, et cetera, et cetera. Very kind of typical UFO contactee stuff. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But he had no recollection of, you know, running around in the field and, and howling like a bad man and so forth. So, uh, very, very interesting, you know, and, and I thought it was very interesting that his, his own father said, you know, he, he was acting like he was possessed. It's interesting that you seize upon that because it's, it's one of those things where it becomes a little bit difficult in the literature to discern, Mm. mind control and hypnosis uh from possession but things that do happen to seem to be like spirit possession related uh have at least some precedent in certain um certain indigenous lore as well the idea that you know these bigfoot can hypnotize you um there's a great book that we that we that we uh was really sort of the 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 grandfather to to where the footprints in which is just called bigfoot by ann slate and al barry and there is plenty of odd activity in there including someone having just this sort of sensation of something in his body a witness um and while this didn't necessarily involve bigfoot directly it was during a bigfoot expedition so you have to sort of look at as tim and i have talked about exclusively or extensively rather 
mm-hmm. the company that that these things keep. Um, so you know, the book volume number one does touch upon that possession angle, but uh, when I talk about Bigfoot in relation to altered states of consciousness in volume two, uh, we we definitely bring that topic up there a, a, a great deal. There's an interesting case um, in 1979. Um, some Pennsylvania Dutch youths were in a in a field, and they saw this you know this this man like figure jumping towards them like a kangaroo. This is in volume two, so <laughs> it's it's a new one if anybody's listening. And it's this hairy man creature that like gives one of these witnesses this electrical jolt, uh, and he feels as if something controls him, and he begins speaking in tongues before the uh, the creature you know yells in the same tongue and, and bounds off to the woods, and he eventually recovers. Just weird, really, really strange stories that shouldn't uh, find their way into descriptions of giant, uh, you know, <laughs> hairy hominids. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah. It's it's a remarkable uh, correlation. It's, it's uh, I, I, I'd never heard of that before. Obviously, kind of like possession and gin is 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 a, is a very mm-hmm. uh, prominent theme. Well, and you know, in the, in the fairy faith as well. I mean, that was a, yeah. was a very common yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, um, and. Uh, which brings me to kind of the next bit I wanted to ask you guys about is that the idea of the the wilderness geist. Um, if you kind of talk through that idea. So, this was sort of an idea that I, I I had had a while back, which was just the need for us to challenge our own basic assumptions when it comes down to anomalies that we see, and and really sort of dissecting how much of an influence our expectations play into that. So if you take a look at a lot of uh, reports that the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization here in the States would uh, categorize as Class B reports, these are reports that take place in areas that generally have a lot of Bigfoot activity or you know are known to have had activity in the past. But Bigfoot isn't seen, but there's stuff that is associated with Bigfoot sightings that happens. So these are people who, even though they don't see Bigfoot, they might notice an odd smell or hear a strange guttural voice or uh, have, uh, you know, warm rocks thrown thrown in their direction or hear, you know, some sort of knocks or rapping in the forest. And, of course, you know, if, if you're looking at it with a bias that everything that, that's anomalous in the forest is Bigfoot, you're going to sort of jump to that conclusion. But you take all those, uh, those separate phenomena and you place them into a haunted house or, in, you know, a Victorian uh, seance and... It's it's a poltergeist, <laughs> and it gets even more gets even more um, you know it gets even more difficult to separate those phenomena from the poltergeist phenomenon when you consider that hairy hands and even large hairy ape creatures are things that would appear in some of these seances as well. Um, so it it really is sort of about challenging those expectations and saying, well, you know, what if you know does this mean that you know there these people who are going to the woods are actually attracting poltergeist phenomena to themselves and it has nothing to do with, you know, large hairy creatures or are the Bigfoot somehow harnessing those same things as well? Or, you know, is it, which is, this is sort of where I wound up personally is, you know, this idea that all these things, witches, fairies, um, you know, ghosts to a certain degree, they knock and they rap and they smell bad and they talk in strange tongues and they lob warm stones. I mean, it's, it's, I, that's sort of where I, I wind up is that this, it's sort of this soup of archetypal creatures that somehow bleed over into our reality from, from time to time. Uh, and of course, if you ask me in a month, I'll probably have changed my mind on that, but uh, <laughs> that's, 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 that's where I currently sit. So I, I coined the term Wildnisgeist because it was, you know, as opposed to Poltergeist, you know, noisy spirit uh, in German, this is just means a wilderness or a forest spirit. And I thought it was a nice way of talking about that subset of phenomena where things kind of appear Bigfooty, but also share a lot in common with, uh, with, with traditional Poltergeist descriptions. Yeah, it, it's, it, I think, I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's a it's a really good uh, way of framing it. You know, it, it, it pulls it both together and kind of and, and shows the correlations quite clearly. Um, again, it, it was it was coming back to kind of reading through this and, and, and your your ideas and framing. It really brought me back to kind of my own research into into gin and, and the behavior associated with gin. I mean, gin gin is broadly a, it's it's a, a catch all term. It's a, it's very much like fairy is a catch all term for gnomes elves everything um, brownies red caps and, and so on and um like the rapping behavior the smell mm-hmm. the voices no all- I, I was i was i was very encouraged and emboldened uh, to hear you speaking with gordon mentioning you know how how you can sort of overlay gin folklore and fairy folklore over the top of one another because that's something that i've i've felt very strongly about in the past and mm-hmm. uh 
unfortunately, in today's climate, if you say something just to use a shorthand, you say, you know, Middle Eastern fairies, the jinn, people yeah. think that you're implying some sort of objective superiority of one culture over another. And that's not the case. Yeah. I mean, I would feel just as comfortable as saying, you know, the, uh, the Irish jinn, the fairies, <laughs> you know, I think, I think, yeah, yeah. I think what it, what it, what it is, as you so succinctly and well put it in your interview is, uh, is the way that, you know, there seems to be an objective reality that two very disparate cultures are, are describing. And it, it, mm. I think the people who push back on descriptions of of how closely the jinn mirror the fairies don't really realize quite how reap that how quite how deep that particular rabbit hole goes, um, yeah. because well, it is hyper consistent. Well, we it, found the similar thing with this this wild man archetype, and mm-hmm, that it's mm-hmm. it's very dependent upon the cultural lens. Mm. You know, uh, it seems like every culture has one. It's just interpret and, and actually they're all interpreted amazingly uh very similarly throughout the world but the, when there are differences they are often you know it, it comes down to that cultural lens through which the mm-hmm. phenomenon is viewed yeah i th- i think this that it it seems to be a real key to this um, and that kind of we end up getting as, as human beings getting kind of confused and splitting hairs over those differences without kind of seeing the broad kind of the, the broad landscape that whatever this thing is that we're interacting with, it's, it's reading us and ref, and playing. It's, it's almost like playing a role back to us. It's reflecting us. And mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. the, the cultural yeah, I, uh, language we understand. Yeah. Whatever these things are. And, and I've just, you know, broadly call them the other. Um, mm. It's, it's a very reactive phenomenon. I found mm. uh, capricious as well, but reactive. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, I, one of the interesting things as well um, uh, that, that you guys are talking about is, is um, it, magic and kind of the, the interaction with, well, additions, conjuring spirits and, and, and how the apparitions that appear are often, again, large, hairy things, you know, with anim, uh, animistic characteristics. Mm. I was listening to you in, in um, um, I think it was Conspiranormal when you were talking about that, and um, that was that was really intriguing. Uh, like uh, I, I, like I, I know a lot of magicians and 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 work with them, um, looking at these phenomena from a magical perspective. Certainly, kind of um, when I when I approached uh, Middle Eastern magic, it was looking at it in terms of like, well, what's the correlate? How do people relate to jinn? What do they what do they, what do they want from jinn? Um, mm. And uh, you know, again, what what you're describing comes up again and again. Well, you know, it, it's it gets to the point where I remember there was um, it, and if anybody is interested, uh, Tim has a, a podcast that I am am proud to be associated with called Strange Familiars, and he does a great job. But uh, there's one story that, on one of his shows where I, yeah, it's, I love it. There was there was one story on one of his shows that I, I wanted to kind of include in the book, but we couldn't quite because it sort of fell into that sort of big footy kind of things category. But um, it was the 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 guys in the in the forest, Tim, who ended up getting lost and they oh yeah running along the train tracks and stuff. But it was it was the re- the reason that we didn't include it. I think part of it at least is that it looked just as much like a manifestation of a successful spirit conjuration as it did you right. know running into a big you know hairy monster in the woods. Um, uh, and, and you do find that, you know, these things, like a lot of spirit phenomena, tend to manifest themselves in out-of-place areas, often with a history of, you know, some sort of uh, ancient human habitation. Um, they're felt just as often as they're seen. Mm-hmm. They interact with you in, you know, oblique ways. And something that Tim talks about in one of, one of his chapters, you know, the prevalence of uh, of gifting and making offers to Bigfoot, is some of it you read, it sounds just like it came out of, uh, you know, a uh, how-to manual on how to how to how to conjure a spirit. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. There's a a ruined city in New Delhi called Faroz Shah Kulta, and it's supposed to be the most haunted place in Delhi. It's supposed to be uh, it being inhabited by by ten thousand jinns. Mm. And um, so I, I photographed the site uh, a couple of years ago, and um, I again it it, it it really made me kind of go. There's another one um, when you guys are talking about milk, because that's what people leave out for gin when they're petitioning them to intercede on their behalf. Mm. Dishes of milk and bread. 
they're, they're, they're gifting it to to petition them um it's exactly the same thing very common for fairies as well people eat butter butter uh, out for fairies yeah i mean this stuff is it just again and again and again it, it comes around um i don't know if you're speaking of the 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 uh, perkta milk that people leave out for this this uh spirit this kind of herald of of wild men this uh perkta uh but they would leave that on the roof which is another thing we found that, that which i mean that was a very surprising thing to me how many of these wild men are said to climb on people's roofs and and why that is you know that's something we, we need to sort out yet but that happens all over the world. They, they, they will say these wild men climb on top of people's roofs. And even today, Bigfoot reports many, many, many witnesses, especially when they're either on their popul- uh, property, rather, or when they say the creatures followed them home. Uh, often people, if they take a shot at one or if they enter into a gifting exchange and then somehow uh, break the rules, they will say the creatures you know, follow them home. And then these people will often report that these giant ape men are you know, walking on top of their roof, uh, I don't think I've heard of one case where there's been roof damage from a you know eight hundred thousand pound you know Sasquatch running on people's roof, but <laughs> they, they they report this with regularity. I mean, I don't I, you know that's, that's but that's all over the world and and throughout time. I see it's it's incredible. Um, <clears throat> so I one of the, another thing that kind of uh, really jumped out at me was the um, child theft. And the taking of children, obviously, kind of changelings are, are a huge thing in in, in fairy lore, um, and attacking children is also a big thing within gin lore. The, there's a, Lilith is is a big figure within um, Middle Eastern superstition in, in terms of mm-hmm. being the adversary of every mother. That in that because Lilith didn't get her. Her, what well, it seems her birthright to become the, the mother of the human race that um, her and Adam had her falling out um, that she takes that anger out and that envy out on every mother and is young children um, and well, newly borns and and, uh, and new mothers are particularly vulnerable to her influence and there's a whole kind of thing of kind of Lilin vampires which are a, a form of, of gin that, that attack kids fairy lores we all know very well there's a whole thing of changelings but wild men and child theft can you talk to that well you know it's, it's interesting that you would invoke lilith because so i i my book before this and it was it was going to be my last book until <laughs> until tim wrote me into it um was actually all about actually all about uh supernatural child theft uh so i oh. you know i i went down the, the lilith path quite extensively with that um and uh, it was inter- it's interesting to me that, uh, you know, I, this, again, this is something for, for volume two, but we might as well, you know, sort of address it right now. Um, there actually in certain Hebrew lore is a, uh, is a large hairy demon uh, with bird feet, <laughs> which ties into something that you see persistently in, in, in some of these Bigfoot cases. There are a consistent number of outliers that appear to have three toes, which look quite bird-like. So there's actually a, a race of hairy wild demons who live, to the, who live in the woods who were actually one of those variations. These are called the Shadim, one of these variations on the spawn of Lilith, which, of course, you know, Lilith has been attributed as, as birthing, you know, fairy folk as well. Um, you know the world over so so there is sort of a you know a, a a hairy hairy wild man little connection right there um but yes i mean you'll find um you know i you'll find the the archetype of the wild man stealing or the wild woman stealing uh children and leaving a changeling in its place you'll find in certain like eastern european folklore you don't see that as strongly in native american folklore if you're using you know comparisons to bigfoot but you do still find descriptions of of children being taken for all sorts of things from you know literally as food to you know in another echo of that fairy folklore um of you know being used as breeding stock which is something that you see through you know the modern extraterrestrial folklore yeah. and the fairy yeah. folklore and the gen folklore and yeah. all these different all these different uh mm-hmm. these different uh bodies of 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 legend and, and, and lore um so yeah I, yeah it's 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 just it gives me one of those things there's a great quote from uh 
it's a great quote. I don't not, not sure if it made it into the film, but it's from from uh, Ian Fleming's Goldfinger, where you know Oric Goldfinger says, you know, once is happenstance, twice is coincidence, and three times is enemy action. <laughs> and you know, when you're racking up similarities between these things, and you get to you know your forty fifth correlation, you have to start to sit back and say, you know, it's... because for, for me, the, the the objective reality of these things is not. You know, the objective reality of any specific case that we discuss in these 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 books is not as important to me as as is the similarities that you find between these cultures that are separated either, you know, in terms of time or in terms of distance so far apart that they really shouldn't have cross pollinated and shared these these uh, these similarities. Yeah, I mean, I mean, like, you know, the the most uh, kind of empirical scenario is our understanding of migration is completely wrong. You know, our understanding of kind of human migration and human culture uh, uh, traits well, is completely well, wrong. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's like the uh, the anthropologists sort of like paint themselves into a corner. So my first book was was all about, you know, this food taboo that you see in fairy folklore and how a lot of folklore say that came out of Persephone. But you find that same food taboo in, you know, New Zealand and in Japan and in, in North America. You still see that same concept of, you know, if you take food from the other world, you're trapped in the other world. Mm-hmm. So, again, I, 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 one of several things is happening. Either it's an objective reality or... Um, archetypes are much more real than any anyone in academia really wants to uh, admit. Or, you know, number three, um, you know, there was a global civilization well before we have we established our own global civilization. So, any one of those three possibilities really puts a uh, puts a hole in this academic model where uh, these sort of numinous phenomena are completely denied of having any real existence. Yeah. Um. Be- before we leave the um, the, the Lilith um, topic, are you guys familiar with the uh, the Bernie relief? Yes. Mm-hmm. And there's your lovely three toes. Yep. Um, and, an, and an owl, which, I mean, uh, this is... Yeah. T- yeah, t- Tim can speak to that <laughs> actually recently because he's been out in the field and been hearing what seems like an inordinate amount of owls, right, Tim? Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Before anything weird happens, almost det- dependably... We will either hear an owl or on playback of the recording, there will be an owl right before anything weird happens. So, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, it's a thing. <laughs> I, think, I think Mike Cleland established that well before we did, but uh, it's certainly uh, been playing out in my life. What is it about owls? <laughs> they just seem to be this massive symbol of, of um, something odd is going on. Like, it... It, and it's another universal archetype, isn't it? It's 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 oh, everywhere. Yeah. yeah, and and again, I think I think Mike Cleland's the guy to speak on that. He literally yeah. wrote the book on it. But uh, in my experience, I mean, you know, it's I have tons of stories from my own life that that uh, these these owl figures, you know, figure into along with the wild man stuff. It's just it's there. It's, it's there's no question about it in, in my mind. That's, um, I think one that the the Irish word for owl, um, like it's, if I can remember off the top of my head, it's 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 two a.m. but it's two thirty a.m. here, so <laughs> please forgive me. Um, I, it's, it means like graveyard screecher, graveyard talker. Mm. Like, yeah, I mean, you'll find, you know, I think it was in, in certain parts of Eastern Europea, Europea, Europe, <laughs> Eastern Europe. <laughs> this doesn't bode well for my interview later tonight. Um, <laughs> in, for, well, you know, certain parts of Eastern Europe, um, you know, vampires and owls were referred to the same, you know, name with that sort of striga, strigoi root. Um, and, uh, you know, as messengers of, of death and, you know, knowledge, um, almost kind of like quasi Promethean knowledge. Um, and you know, it's, it's one of those things that okay, we keep on touching on things from volume two, but volume two is going to talk about, you know, a lot of these Bigfoot vocalizations. And one of the most common vocalizations is that people say that these things like to hoot like owls, but they always sound way too large and way too, uh, way too deep. But, uh, there's also a robust, um, you know, history amongst the criminal element of using owls as contact calls in the woods, you know, which you, I'm sure if anybody doesn't know what that concept is, it's like, you know, whenever you see a movie where people are usually typically in the military trying to communicate to each other, you know, they'll make some sort of bird noise so that people know, so that they're, you know, <laughs> their Confederates know where they are whenever they're uh, invading an army base or something. Cool. Uh, and then, um, so the, the dogman archetype comes up quite a lot in, in, in your work. 
you, you talk to it around kind of the, the prevalence of the, the dog man um, archetype. Uh, and, and it, it's a separate thing, but but still again, a quite a prevalent one. I think Josh and I have. I, I, tell me if I'm wrong, Josh, but I think we we both settled fairly early on like. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Like, like there's a perfectly good folkloric precedent for Dogman, and mm. and it was called a werewolf. <laughs> and <Yeah. laughs> it seems or, like or or you know you know dog headed saints too. I mean, if we're gonna go down that grimoire sort of route. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, there, there's there's yeah. there's a there's a precedent out there, and this. The whole creation of the dogman phenomenon seems to be this desperate attempt to make another biological, you know, natural animal out of something that is completely other. And as far as I'm concerned, you know, more and more I'm having difficulty making any chance at all of Bigfoot being a natural creature. But, you Mm -hmm. know, there are at least things in the fossil record that kind of look like that. So, you know, I'll, I'll allow for that that small chance of that being true but there's nothing in the fossil record that looks like dog man and, and it mm-hmm. to me it makes zero sense a dog is a evolutionarily speaking a dog is a very efficient creature uh mm-hmm. for it to evolve broad shoulders and and hands it just it's, it's a completely uh outrageous idea mm-hmm. so the idea that there's a natural cre- breeding population of giant dog-headed you know upright things out there is, is mm-hmm. a bordering on silly to me but mm-hmm. We do, like I said, we have this this wonderful history and folklore of, of werewolves. Yep. Where we'll talk about these things, and uh, they certainly fit into the to the general you know wild man idea. Uh, mm-hmm. Josh has made this you know wonderful kind of chart where he's connected all these you know different like wild man archetypes, and uh, certainly the, the the werewolf is part of that. Well, the, the thing about the dog man that really that really kind of resonated with me was the, the whole thing of of Herman Nubis, that um mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That, yeah the merged figure of of um, Hermes and Anubis and, and then and then t- you know talking about these things as being being archetypes and kind of having kind of meaning and 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 the, thematic elements to them that that they they carry with them whenever this form turns up. Um, you, you mentioned dog-headed saints, uh, Joshua, and you, like you know, like Saint Christopher in the Orthodox Church has a dog head. Yeah, uh, the, the one that I come back to is always a little bit more literally a dog. I always think of Saint Gynefort, um, but right. uh, but uh, but yeah, yeah, the exact same idea. And, and I think speaking sort of to, Tim, to Tim's point, you know, if you look for some sort of dog man analog in the fossil record which is where most cryptozoologists go i mean for any, everything let's face it yeah. you know they, they always try to say that you know things are an extinct this or an ex- relic of that yeah um no no evidence but if you start broadening you know the possibility of what this could be to spirit phenomena there's mm-hmm. any number of things like dog-headed saints like you know uh, entities that you'd find in a grimoire uh mm-hmm. that sort of have a little bit more of a comparison so yeah herman and you know, herman Umbus, as you mentioned is, is definitely part of mm-hmm. that uh same cluster of of uh entities that get that sort of theory anthropized absolutely and and it's it you know uh, and if people are looking for these things you know go and talk to a shaman you know go and... <laughs> exactly yeah like these theriotropic figures turn up again and again and again you know um and this is where we had our first interaction with a lot of these things um <clears throat> Now, um, I guess the the one theme that you guys uh, I presented that that was relatively new for a lot of people was the idea of the the like the, the company that Bigfoot keep, but particularly the the woman in white. That was a uh, was an interesting one. Yeah. <laughs> so, so so I I have to say this I have to say this every time we talk about this and Tim knows exactly what I'm going to say and I'll keep it brief this time but. Tim came to me at this correlation, and I told him he was full of it, and that there was nothing to it, and that I will be damned if he did not make it one of the most compelling correlations I think I've ever seen. So, well, well done, buddy. Well done. Well, I, I, might have, I might have an extension of it for you. Wonderful. wonderful. I, I mean, at this point, people are... Someone on Facebook, in uh, I think it was in the Radio Mysterioso group, did this sort of pop culture thing where he, he found these examples in artwork of women in white and these ape like creatures, just example after example, after example. And it was like, and that's nowhere I even went with it. I did, you know, I didn't even think to look, you know, at representations in art. I was so uh, happy to find the, you know, the folkloric uh, evidence for it. 
that I, I just went with that. And to see this person will kind of take that and run and find these all these connections again and again from from artwork and from movies. And and it, it's just really uh, something that seems to be embedded in in our, you know, our psychological makeup or, or our approach to these wild creatures. These wild men, I should say. But uh, yeah, it's um, so. I it came from modern cases to begin with. It came from uh, on. There's a show called Sasquatch Chronicles, which is uh, my favorite Bigfoot podcast because it's it's just witness encounters uh, for the most part. Every now and then, Wes will have a a author on or a researcher, but you know, 95 percent plus of the time, it's just witnesses telling what they saw in their stories, and and uh, it very very interesting for me for that point because you don't get a lot of interference of you know what uh what uh, the cryptozoologist you know pet theory of the moment is whether it's gigantopithecus or relic dominant or whatever you just get people telling what they saw what they experienced what they felt when it happened and uh, there was a story on there about uh, these two brothers who were seeing a, a bunch of bigfoot creatures uh of all different shape and sizes, all the, you know, from things that look like chimpanzees to things that look like, you know, giant, uh, you know, more human like things covered in hair, like Neanderthals to even, a, they even saw a green haired creature. Mm-hmm. So the very strange variety of creatures they were seeing on the, on their property, they lived near each other in a neighborhood. And then they started seeing this, this woman, this very old hag like woman come around. And there were some strange details about her. They said once she was, she was, taller than they would expect she was very tall for for a woman they said she wore they she always wore white they said she always wore these white clothes and she wore shoes that looked too big for her feet they said they looked like she was wearing clown shoes and i said wow this is really interesting and i kind of followed it away but on the sasquatch chronicles forums i started seeing other people say you know what i was out i saw this weird woman in white walking down the road i drove two miles down the road i saw a bigfoot so now I'm like, okay, well, that's weird. So like more than one person has seen this. And I started talking about it on Strange Familiars a little bit. I had a guy call me. He said he was a witness, a uh, Bigfoot witness in a nearby forest. He said, you know, come meet me and uh, I'll show you where I saw what I saw. But I want to show you something else as well. And he took me to a place called Palm Bank, which was less than a mile away from where he had his. He had two different encounters roughly in the same area. And uh, this was less than a mile away as the crow flies. And he says, you know, this is a, the village of Pond Bank and it's named after this pond. And he takes me to the pond. He said, now, here's the interesting thing. There's a, the legend to this pond is there's a lady in white spirit, this white lady of Pond Bank, they called her, who also is, uh, supposedly killed her, her child. So here you have the, the, the children, killing children connection again as well. And uh, as I'm interviewing him, by the way, for the podcast, the, the throughout the interview, as we're at Palm Bank, you can hear this very, very low guttural groan while we're t- speaking through the whole thing. It's a really, really interesting clip. Uh, I don't know what that was. It was not a frog. This was a very, very cold day in early March when we met. There were no frogs out. But um, it was constant, too. It sounds like, like tube and throat singing or something. Wow. But uh, in any case, here's this other one. And then, you know, so I started... I get I get a lot of local calls. I'm kind of you know I'm I'm very happy that I'm kind of the local Bigfoot guy now. So I'll get people call me and say have a Bigfoot sighting, and and I get out to their property as soon as possible and try to you know figure out what they saw and where and and do all the normal you know Bigfoot stuff. And uh, I started just asking people you know what other weird stuff happened, and uh, time after time I'm getting these people saying that they have encounters with spirits as well and a lot of times are women in white spirits. So now I'm like, well, okay, there's obviously something to this. It's happening too much to be just a coincidence. So then it became a matter of digging back in folklore. And I started finding little hints here and there, but um, I was looking into the, the women in white that manifest for the, the uh, high families of Austria. And they, they were um, death omens for these Austrian families. Wow. And, I'm kind of looking into those, seeing if there was any kind of connection with model men there. And I came upon one and they said uh, the name of the spirit, they said was Bertha, which is the medieval form of Perkta. And it had some sort of thing. So like Perkta was the Teutonic moon god- goddess. So, like, okay, so I go back and dig into Perkta. Now, Frau Perkta is this amazing 
uh, I don't know if she's quite a goddess figure. I think some people would argue she's more of a, a kind of a Germanic Baba Yaga type figure. Right. And uh, she wore white. She could appear as, you know, young and beautiful or old and hag-like. Uh, she said to manifest with one or both feet being large swan's feet. So here you have this bird foot thing again with the three toes, with the appearance of three toes. And uh, the thing that really clutched it for me was it, it said she has uh, this retinue that follow her around uh, that take the form of two things. And one was the Heimchen, which were the souls of the, the dead children, which she lured away into the woods and, and killed. And they took the form of these will the wisp lights, so these, these orbs that people see around Bigfoot all the time. And the other things that followed her around were called the Perkton. And they were it's literally a group of hairy wild men that, uh, you know, she followed her around and tormented people and ran through towns and, and climbed on people's roofs and so forth. And that was really just the beginning of breaking this open. And from that point, I started looking at wild men all over the world. As I said, I haven't found one from um, the Far East yet, but... Uh, Russia, North Africa, all over Europe, uh, there are these wild men and their significant other, or sometimes they'll say their wife, uh, sometimes they'll just say they have a helper spirit or something, but it, it takes the form again and again of these spirits that appear in white, and they're specifically noted to wear white. It's, that's, it's, it's so interesting. That really is incredible. Um, and what it, what it got me thinking around was um, kind of the, the some of the nature spirit or nature guardian motifs where you kind of get the the, the hominid, but also into the kind of more kind of pan like figures, mm-hmm. and like the the horned god or the um, the uh, the wood woe, all that kind of figure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's. No, oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. <laughs> But it, but particularly kind of Pan and and the idea of um, that universal kind of nature guardian nature spirit that kind of the animalistic the the, the spirit of the wilderness of, of the wild and um, in in Ireland in a, a town called Calorgan um, every year they capture uh, there's a place called a, it's called a puck fair puck mm-hmm. is a reference to to, mm-hmm. to um, to a goat but it's also a word for a fairy puck as well you know mm-hmm. and um they catch one off the mountain and they've, they've got these huge big arching horns that go back uh, over their back and um they're they're taken down to the town and they're crowned king um of the king for a year and they get a bride and the bride is a young girl probably around 13 dressed in white oh wow and um, I'll send you I'll send you links to some photographs of it afterwards. But um, yeah, it, don't, it was just like that. Wow, <laughs> that's <laughs> amazing. Talking. Yeah, it, it's as Josh said at some point when I when I started just hammering him with with example after example of this. I think he said you know drinking through it's like drinking from a fire hose. There's just <laughs> there's so much, and I'm I'm so overjoyed. This is one of those things that that you know. I'm very happy I made the connection, but I'm also excited to see where it goes from here because I've already heard people talking about it on other podcasts. And like I said, I saw the guy, you know, talking about that in that Facebook group and using all those examples. And, uh, you know, I'm sure I just scratched the surface and it's just going to get bigger from here. And I'm just, I just hope I can uh, keep my finger on the pulse of it because I'm just interested to see where it goes. I, I don't own yeah. it. It's just something I, I, I kind of put together but I really do want to follow it. I want to see where it goes from here. Yeah, one of yeah. my favorite one of my favorite uh, little little in bits of trivia that shows how deeply Jacques Vallée was involved with Close Encounters of the Third Kind is that the hero puppet at the end of the film, the the main model that they use, they nicknamed on set, they nicknamed it Puck. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but you know, speaking to what you're talking about with with Pan and whatnot, I mean. Yeah, it, and Tim, Tim, I still need to send you this this giant <laughs> this giant like conspiracy board that I that I have of all these different archetypes and how they all connect. But you know, yeah, you've, you've got Pan, which sort of grows out of this Dionysian foliate god motif, which is tied in with the wood woes, which is also tied in with Odin, who is kind of a wild man archetype, who is associated with Santa Claus, who you know associates with elves and runs along your rooftop, and you know, 
is closely related to the the, the Belsch nickel, which uh, which I think Tim hardly or handily rather uh, demonstrates is also sort of associated with this Bigfoot or, uh, motif as well. But you know, then you start bringing in the fact that there's not a folklorist really in academia who would argue with the fact that the wild man archetype is a derivative of you know satyrs and, and fauns mm-hmm. and uh and you know satyrs and fauns cavort with you know traditionally with you know pagan worshipers who work you know in christian literature were, were in christian belief were made into witches mm-hmm. and also you know elves and fairies themselves but uh, there's you know it's it's a you know one interesting case that sort of ties in the whole fawn thing and the uh the bigfoot thing which is this uh traverse spine gorilla flap that happened in labrador canada where it was basically a bigfoot but it left behind these giant cloven hooves <laughs> everywhere it went <laughs> and you know you're gonna get cryptozoologists who say oh they had you know they had foot injuries or they're you know an inbred population and any number of things to sort of reverse engineer it as opposed to looking at where the folklore has come and how it might be some sort of you know reification mm-hmm. of of that of that particular body of of uh, of knowledge yeah, I mean, it, the, and and that the the cloven hoof footprints, um, you know, where where they shouldn't be, uh, that that turns up again and again in folklore. I mean, actually, it was in in the village that I grew up in. There was uh, an elderly farmer who lived near me, um, who uh, occasionally I'd call it to see, uh, mainly to get him to tell me about the folklore of the area, and that was one of the stories. Yeah, there was yeah that obviously it was old Nick. Had visited the mm-hmm. town and uh, you know, left snowy cloak hoop footprints up over roofs, down across um, farmyards. But there you go, up up over roofs. And it just that's only just comes to me now when I'm thinking about it. Yeah. Um, I, I, so you know that that does happen again and again. And and then um, I, I spoke to this one on when I was on um, on Gordon's podcast and that. Um, when I was hearing these stories and kind of chatting to kind of the the, the kind of older uh, generation about kind of their beliefs, um, like they they it was a, it was it was a real thing, like mm-hmm. that that's the thing that kind of um that really struck me again when I was in in um in India and and other um Islamic countries, um on India's not Islamic country, but um, countries where the, uh, the, the Islamic faith is, is prevalent, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, that uh, the belief in the jinn is, is a real thing. And that that was that really brought me back to it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we, sorry, go ahead, Tim. We run into this. Um, and, and I'd like to say, whenever I do these folk, yeah, when I do these interviews, rather, when we talk about folklore, um, I've heard people, especially cryptozoologists, used it in a very disdainful manner. The word folklore, it's, like, ah, it's just folklore, mm. you know, as if it doesn't matter and it means nothing. And, um, I, you know, for me personally, the folklore that we have handed down, this is our ancestors telling us how they dealt with this weird stuff and how they experienced it. And sometimes it gets exaggerated and changed. And that's the folk process. I mean, it just happens. But mm-hmm. uh, the essential details and, and the essential truths are there. Uh, so I don't, it's not the same thing as fiction at all. And it ties into these these ideas of archetypes and these ideas of the other. And uh, I, when I talk about this stuff being folklore, resonating with folklore, I'm not saying that. I don't believe people are absolutely seeing what they say they see. I mean, I've talked to enough witnesses where I, I a thousand percent believe these witnesses saw what they saw. They've been deeply affected by this, but uh, you know, I think this modern, especially I, I guess in, I, I don't know if it's just in America, but or Western culture in general, we have this idea that, that folklore is fiction and uh, it's not really the case. And I, I'd like to make that apparent whenever I talk about this, that, that I'm not saying, Oh, all these Bigfoot witnesses, they, they just saw, you know, they, an illusion or something. That's not uh, what I'm saying at all. I'm just saying what they see resonates with folklore. Yeah, th- there was there was an interview that that Tim and I were on recently, and and I was, looked at one of the, <laughs> made the mistake and I looked at the comments, which were almost you know entirely positive. But there was one person who was like, you know, I really like Josh and Tim's other work, but they're talking about projecting out you know Jungian archetypes or something and that's just as bad as somebody saying oh I believe you you I believe you believe what you saw and that's not I mean I think if I think Tim and I both believe that there's an objective reality to this stuff we're just trying to figure out you know it's it's uh 
it's it's root cause, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, going back to the, the to the to the folklore theme and kind of how, how sometimes it's you know it's, it's held in low esteem by I mean a lot of times it's like kind of academic professionals. Um, the, there's an element to that of just infantilization of um, uneducated people uh, and and the stories they tell. You know, if these stories weren't documented, um, that they've come down through, they've come down through kind of folk memory, uh, mm-hmm. handed down from kind of you know from from parent to child. Um, there's, I think, there's an element of sometimes just disdain for it, um, yeah. um, and uh, and, that, and that's a shame because it's 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 assuming that the people who are telling these stories um, don't understand what they've seen, you know. Um, or they're, they're mistaking it for something else. There's always right. that kind of assumption. Yeah, yeah. We, well, we run into it in the Bigfoot world. Um, uh, cryptozoologists are very, very fond of uh, talking about all the different uh, names that uh, native, various Native American tribes had for these creatures, or what, it, what seemed to be these creatures. And uh, they will invoke them, you know, constantly. Oh, you know, this tribe called it Oma, and this tribe called it this, and this tribe called it that. While throwing out the fact that uh, many, 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 uh, certainly most, uh, a great majority of them would say that they were not natural creatures, or if they did say they were natural, they'd also attribute some sort of magical powers to them. Mm-hmm. They would say, yes, they are, they're another tribe of Indians, of, of hairy Indians, but they're also, you know, these great sorcerers, and they have these powers and so forth. So there's, you know, there's something other about them in almost every case, I, I believe, in uh, in Native American folklore, and that information is is disregarded. They they like to say, you know, oh, you know, Native Americans have talked about these for thousands of years. So so basically, they are. It's a form of weird washing, as we say. They like to, to to like only take those bits that make it sound like a natural creature, but it's also, I think, very disrespectful to mm-hmm. the, the tradition. It's it's saying that, oh. They knew what they were talking about when they saw a big hairy thing, but it's, but they didn't know the difference between something you know magical and strange and supernatural and and, and a natural creature. Yeah, it, it it sort of falls into that same pitfall that a lot of ancient aliens <laughs> speculation does. You know, it's this idea that you know these civilizations didn't know it, didn't they didn't recognize what they were talking about. You know, they were, they obviously were around for thousands and thousands of years and probably knew their natural world better than we ever will, but they didn't know what they were talking about. They were mistaking. They were mistaking these these spirits for these these aliens for spirits. Well, you know, the the, the indigenous people just just didn't understand that you know these these uh, these giant monkeys could do all this you know really really cool ninja ninja stuff in the forest and, and <laughs> it seemed and seemed to disappear. Um, so yeah, it's it's it sort of falls. I think if, if you really get really critical, I think it kind of falls into that category as well. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree, um, and. You know, which is why I think this 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 work you're doing is 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 fantastic, correlating all this and, and pulling it all together. Um, and and when is the when is the second book released? It all um, goes well yeah. before the end of the year. Now the, the first volume had several delays, and I'm hoping that we don't fall into that pitfall. Uh, with the second volume, it's it's looking good. It's looking good that, that we mm-hmm. could get it out before the end of the year. It's it's literally what I'm going to work on actually after we hang up. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, I, I had one um, bit I wanted to kind of ask you before um, I, I, I let you guys go and I go back to bed. <laughs> um, is the idea of uh, actually when we were talking about at the start the idea of kind of like there's a there's always a cultural element to these that's reflected back to the observer that um, European peasants tend to see fairies that wear clothes that are kind of relatively similar to theirs or maybe slightly out of the time period, but, you know, not kind of hundreds of years ago. They look relatively um, similar and, and then similarly with with, 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 with gin um, and, and their attire. Um, there's the whole thing with, with um, you know, with aliens where in the 1880s you had the weird airships um in the in the 1940s when people had those alien encounters they were like we're from venus we're from mars as we got closer to venus and mars the aliens got further away um and they were always trying to keep us just at arm's length to try and understand what they what these things are and what um 
what they're choosing to reveal to us. Do you think it's a similar thing with with, with Bigfoot? <laughs> well, Tim's Tim's got the mic drop on this one. I mean, yeah, it definitely recontextualizes itself. So, yeah, it's um, so I, I've done a couple other books, and and I will continue to do them um, of collections of old newspaper articles, mm. which in which people seem to be talking about uh, what I believe are Bigfoot uh, from the 1800s on up to you know 1920s or so. And uh, this is before they were called Bigfoot, so they, they call them wild men, which is a much more resonant term for me. Mm-hmm. And uh, a lot of these reports had uh, these, these wild men in the 1800s uh, wearing scraps of clothing and uh, sometimes even carrying like rusty muskets that, that don't function mm-hmm. or uh, building fires or cooking over fires and so forth. And, you know, when I was writing those books... Um, you know, I started, I think it's a very natural place to start where you think of it as some undiscovered creature. And that's kind of where I started with, with Bigfoot. And uh, now I always knew there was something weird about it. I knew there was weird things associated with it, but I thought like, well, it's, you know, it's probably, this is something that we could probably, you know, one day have a body of or something. Uh, I, I no longer believe that's possible, but mm. at the time I did. And, and so I sort of reasoned it as these, these uh, sort of uh, Victorian morals and these old you know, things, and they didn't—they just couldn't take the idea of a naked wild man running around the woods. So either the reporter or their editors, you know, threw clothes on the creature. You know, like you know, instead of having this naked wild man, they, they'd say, "Oh, you know, he had a loincloth on, or, or uh, you know, torn up old old shirt or something." And uh, you know, over time, I started thinking about this, and it was really as regards to to the way the ufo phenomena changed and you go back to you know our medieval wild men and and their uh wizards there's these there's these wise wizards of, of the woods and uh, you know they're they're very wise and and they had knowledge and and so forth and moving up to the 1800s you have these these sort of uh you know wild scary hairy things but they they still have trappings of humanity they have uh you know, like I said, these rusty muskets and, and clothing and, and sometimes fires even. And then uh, you move to today where we have this this very, very wild, you know, ape-like, you know, Bigfoot wild man, which has, uh, you know, very, very few trappings of, of modern man at all. And it seems as the UFO phenomenon, it seems to like technologically stay ahead of us and, and change and, and, and more so always, it's always ahead of us technologically. As you said, it gets gets further away in a sense. You know, now nowadays our UFOs are like plasma balls and and flying yeah. jellyfish and and so forth. Uh, the wild man archetype seems to get wilder, and I wonder if it's not sort of a an, an opposite mirror reaction to the UFO thing that as we ourselves are less connected with the Earth and we're less connected with those wild parts of ourselves. If we sort of uh, need our archetypical wild men to become wilder in that sense, right. as we pull further from nature, our wild man gets, you know, gets closer to nature as our uh, sort of intercedent uh, to that. I, I don't know if that's the case, but uh, it certainly seems to be changing and does change, you know, with the times. Well, and, you know, I think that I think that these phenomena definitely do uh, respond to us in, in this sort of fashion and and. I think what's a key thing to look at when, whenever we look at things is how um, sometimes inversion equals representation. So if, I don't know if you have any sort of musical background, but if, if you look at, uh, for example, a major third or a minor sixth, they're the same notes can even be the same. They can be the, they're the, they can be the same two notes, but depending upon how they're stacked and how they're voiced, it's either a minor up, uh, you know, a ma- major third or a minor sixth. Anyway. Uh, and, 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 and so it's the same, it has the same quality, a same, a same consonants. And I think about uh, something that, that uh, Patrick Harper uh, said, which was that, you know, uh, the uh, aliens are always coming and coming, but never here. And the fairy folk are always going and going, but never gone. <laughs> so <laughs> that, that sort of inversion equals representation kind of thing, I think ties into this idea that, yeah. uh, that these phenomena sort of respond to where our culture is at any sort of given time. Yeah, I, th- I think yeah, there definitely is something to it. I, mean, I think there's a, there's a story that Eddie, Eddie, I think it was Eddie Lenahan, um, mm-hmm. um, came up with, which was um, there used to be regularly see uh, fairy lights on the hills in Ireland, um, 
up until the civil war in the 1920s um, and, and, and in our, the war of independence and the civil war subsequently afterwards where you had flying columns of, of, of men kind of living out in, 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 in the bogland and the wildland and then um, obviously the advent of, of electricity came and the lights disappeared so that you know they weren't as frequent and um, and I thought that was really poignant when, you, when you, the idea of like electricity coming or people going into their space and the, and, and the lights um, disappearing and the lights uh, um, re- retracting. Um, and it was, uh, sorry, go ahead. There's a, uh, a kind of similar thing happens with, with Darwin and, and Wild Men. There's, there's not really this idea that you can catch them or, or kill them and, and have a body I'm, until Darwin, really. I mean, there, there may be a couple cases before that of, you know, people attempting to get, but really this, this idea, this, this grand idea that we're going to, you know, get one and put it in a circus sideshow or, or whatever, you know, that kind of comes post Darwin, the, the idea of, of catching a wild man. I was uh, really intrigued by your um, podcast on the lights you've been seeing, Tim. Mm, yeah, yeah. That's uh, very, uh, very exciting stuff. Uh, you I, had any hair, hair well, for a choice of words, hairy experiences out there? I've had some really scary things uh, associated with the lights. In fact, uh, my main investigation partner, by the way, I took Josh to see him and, and he saw nothing. There was just nothing yeah. there. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. I, yeah, I, I tend to be a paranormal kryptonite. I, I went to the, I went to the shores, went to the shores of Loch Gur and at like 1 a.m. and didn't see anything there either. You know, just, so uh, but, tonight, that's hilarious. <laughs> but my, my main investigation partner, who and, and we've gotten into some some creepy creepy situations um way out in the middle of forests and so forth where you know that we were six miles from nowhere and and if something goes wrong you know we're we're just gonna have to deal with it while we're out there it's, it's not a lot else we can do uh th- this place where we're seeing the lights is is not remote at all there's there's civilization around it and right. uh, he says he's far more afraid of that place than, than any of those those encounters we've had in the forest he's he's gotten uh very, very creeped out in the area. But, uh, you know, the last time we went, we had an absolutely beautiful experience. I don't know if it was the combination of people we had there. We had, you know, there was a woman with us. We, I think it was the first woman we'd taken there. I don't know if it was a different vibe there, but uh, they were very playful and the, the lights seemed to be interested in us and, and came within six or eight feet of us. Uh, wow. Re- really amazing experience. And I, and I, I was very, very happy because uh, one of the fellows I took there, he's, he's a great friend of mine and he's a very into like a, uh, you know, natural, you know, edibles and stuff. And, he, you know, convinced there'd be an explanation for this. He, he said, you know, he's convinced that, that he would find an explanation for this. And he went up there and, and uh, saw the lights and was completely blown away. And it, which made me very happy because here was someone who was, you know, convinced that sure. having not seen them and having just heard the stories was convinced that, that uh, we were probably seeing something that was explainable. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, it was just a just a wonderful night. There was nothing scary or, or freaky at all about it. So, you know, again, I, I say it's. I guess this the whole phenomenon is just capricious and it can change on a dime. And but uh, for whatever reason, that night was just this really really playful, fun kind of you know neat experience of four people standing there and having lights come up to them. That's incredible. Really but incredible. but in the past, we've been like growled out there. I've seen yeah. eye shine of something. Uh, you know, that was eight feet off the ground at least. And, uh, you know, the Chad, my investigation partner, the one I was talking about, he got growled at by something which sent him immediately into his truck and, and we left. He's like, nope, I don't want any part of that. It was right by me and, and, and growled at me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so the, we've had some some kind of stuff that's, uh, I've been, uh, I guess, pixie led in the woods there. I, I was only about an acre or two of woods. I got, was completely lost in for over an hour. I could hear the traffic going by. I could not find my way out. I was with somebody else. So I've had some, you know, some kind of harrowing things happen there, but uh, also some, some pretty wonderful things. It's, it's fantastic work. Uh, um, really, really engaging and fantastic, um, fantastic to, to follow. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you both for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, it's it's a, a great piece of work and I'm really looking forward to volume two. And uh, I really appreciate you guys taking the time to to talk to us. Well, thanks for having us.
Well, that was a lot of fun. A huge thanks to both Joshua and Tim for taking the time to appear on the show. I really, really appreciate it. Um, that was a fantastic conversation and really just added an, an, another layer of complexity and correlation to the mystery. Um, the Bigfoot possession stuff really blew my mind. That's, that's, that's incredible. Um, just just more to unpack there. Obviously, kind of looking back on the show is one thing kind of... I, I, that brings to mind now is is that the terrientropic nature of how jinn are represented and how jinn have been observed in in the past very similar you know like hairy hominids at times the links to find joshua and tim are below in the show notes um you know they've got some great publications and of course uh, the strange familiars podcast as i mentioned earlier is phenomenal really worth checking out thanks guys that was brilliant Okay, that's it for this week's show. I hope you guys really enjoyed that. As always, if you enjoyed the show, come and join the Patreon and and, uh, get in the mix. That's it for me. Take care.